Welcome to all ball. Format unique, all access for all y'all. What the spiel like? Back full of elite athletes that want to teach and it speaks to the street, so it feel right. Marcus Liberty, your legend on the North Dakota, give you what you need. Robert Reed is your co host. Go, get, go, yeah. go, Like and subscribe and follow, like a crossover. Never know what might fall through this bitch tomorrow, so. Uh, all ball Chicago. All ball Chicago. All ball Chicago. It's all I know. It's all ball Chicago. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of All Ball Chicago. I am your co-host, Robert Bobby Reed, and I got the legend, the NBA veteran, the McDonald's All-American, your host, Marcus, living in the building. What's up, Marcus? Man, I'm over here moving like I was about to percolate over here, man. <laughs> <laughs> to all you house heads out there, you, to all of our house heads out there, you know what we're talking about. I can never do the percolator. I mean, either, man. <laughs> Me either. I could not see you 6 8 doing the damn percolator. It's time for the percolator. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Hey, hey. hey. That's, that's what's up, man. Hey, but uh, before we even jump off to, you know, our guest and, and when he gets ready to come on, um, man, some good things been happening throughout the city, man. Finally, just do. To the uh, to the legend, man, high school legend Ben Wilson. You know, he finally his family's finally getting some some recognition for him. You know, for his basketball play and what he did for his neighborhood and how he represented Simeon High School, number twenty five, man, Ben Wilson. Shout out to street. Ben, man. Going to have Shout a street name out there. Seventy eighth and Everhart, if I'm not mistaken, that's where the, they they doing it at. And uh, yeah. it's unfortunate, man, really, though, you know? Yeah, man. Yeah. It's unfortunate, man. You know? You know and I, I say that all the time, man. Like, when people, we lose people, we, we tend to, you know, want to do. But when they were here, you know, it's like you were too busy trying to hate on them or hate on a person instead mm -hmm. of, you know, being proud of that person, man. And And we see that a lot, you know, not just in Chicago, but throughout you know, our, our world, man, we live in. Yeah, hey, it's funny, man. You know, the the new generation, they call it hating. But back <laughs> then, in our days, it was player hating. You know, player man, hating. why you playing hating, you know? But it's true, though, man. They, and nobody, you know, guys like you who played and did all those big things, nobody wants to celebrate you until you're gone. Yeah. You know, and it's unfortunate, yep. man. And I want to always applaud you, Liv, for always giving Ben his roses. Oh because, man! Because historically, bro, they always put y'all against each other. Yeah, and I know you personally. You hate that. Yeah. You hate it with a passion, man. Because yeah. you always like, hey, man, he did his thing. I did my thing. Let us just enjoy what we did. You know, and, and we have respect for each other, man. He showed me love when he saw me, and I showed him love when I seen him. It was always that, man. No matter if you played the game. A basketball man, sure. When you when you get between those lines, you competing. But off the court, man, it should be nothing but love, nothing but love. And that's all, that's the way I was taught. And I'm gonna always, you know, do that to my my fellow hoopers, my young hoopers. You know, the people I played against, and and the people I didn't play, you know, against. Even if I meet somebody that never played, I played against. I'm gonna still show them mad love. That's real, man. And that don't happen often. So shout out to you, Liv, for still holding that 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 real Chicago mystique. You know right. what we all about. You know, they always talk about the Chicago, the city of haters. I'm not going to continue to say that because when right. you put that on Chicago, that means all of us. That's right. That's right. And um, next week, yeah, we definitely going to have the young lady, Cheryl Cook, right? Cheryl Cook is going to be on next Wednesday. So we already got in contact with her. But let's, uh, I guess, man, let's jump right on in to with my man, man. You know, uh, oh Tim, the, the referee. Let's, uh, let's get him on. Are you ready for this, Bob? Let me give it to y'all real quick. Man. Right, give him an intro, man. Give him his intro. Man, this man been refing the game for over thirty years. He done refed on every level. He's one of the elite refs in the game. He got one of the hottest documentaries out right now called Flagrant Foul. 
Man, I just love him, man. Give it up to Tim Donahue, man. He don't know about Chicago, baby. <laughs> What's I up, Tim? You, I need you guys to do my PR. <laughs> oh, man, this is an honor for me, man, to be with you two legends, man. Thanks for having me, Lib and Mr. Tim Dunny. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, man, Tim. I know you're busy, man. You're a busy man, right? But uh, I know you said you've been watching our show. You've been you you was watching it, and you told me one time you said, "Man, y'all gotta stay with one time, man." I'm I'm trying to watch it, but I can't never watch it because you always you come on at twelve, you come on at one, you come on at two. <laughs> so so Tim, sure. we, we we stick it with one time now, man. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, so how you doing, man? I'm doing terrific. Uh, you know, I, I miss having breakfast with you. We have to get together again. No doubt, no doubt. We will do that. And you was in Houston, if I'm not mistaken, for the World Series, right? I was in Houston. I went out there for the Eagles game Thursday night, and uh, they were supposed to play Friday night, the Phillies, and because of the rain out, they moved it to Saturday. So uh, oh. but it was definitely great to get out there and uh, – you know, see the Eagles and, and see them continue to do well. And, uh, you know, it's always good. I, I felt this way when I when I ref basketball. But when you see somebody like Jalen Hurts, who you know is just a top-notch guy doing so well, it, it really gives you more interest in rooting for them. Right, right. For those of all uh, out there listening to us right now, we have a man, Tim, on former NBA ref, man, ref a lot of, you know, NBA games. He's tuning in. He's jumping in. He's with us right now, live on location. We live. And, uh, Tim, I just want to ask you this, man. And, and you don't have to ask, answer it if you don't want to. Someone told me before, when a certain player, like these elite players, that have been in the league for a very long time, they got a signature move. And they, they might be traveling or they might be doing something. Do, do some do some do some referees let that go? Absolutely. I mean, uh, they always say that the star players are are out there, and it's definitely a um, you know situation where it's a show, and the referees need to uh, be in a position to to make the show look good and and be good for the fans because people don't pay twenty five hundred dollars to sit in the front row to see referees call traveling on guys like LeBron James or or Kobe Bryant. So. Unless it's really overt, uh, as a referee, you're really concentrating on the defender because he's the one that's going to commit the foul. So if it's really not an overt travel, you know, it's let go. Okay, okay, yeah, I thought so, man. Because I was, I remember when I first got in, it was my rookie year, and it, the ref, was, I can't remember what referee came and spoke to us, but he had said that because one of the guys that was with our group, he's like. Man, Patrick Ewing travels all the time with that spin move, and, and they never call it. So, <laughs> and yeah, it was like, funny that you brought that up because I remember they did want to take that spin move out of the game for whatever reason, and and I don't know why, but they told us to call it no matter who did it, and I called it on Michael Jordan one night <laughs> in Philly. Twenty thousand people boo me, right? It's called going for their home team, and there's a timeout and. Michael starts giving me a bunch of crap, and Phil Jackson comes at me, and I said, wait a second, Phil, you saw the training tapes all the referees get? And he and I said, they want that called. And he looked at me, and he said, they may want that called, but they don't want it called on him. <laughs> Walk away. <laughs> and, and it was true. You know, they, they just they, – they wanted the stars to, you know, succeed and, and, you know, put on a show for the fans and the referees to stay out of it unless – you know, it was something over. So was the so was the referees a little bit intimidated by these star players, or it seemed like you wasn't because you made the call? But is it is that the case? I think these? early on you are definitely uh, in awe of being on the floor with you know the greatest athletes in the world. Um, you know, even after you know first time I met you, I still was kind of in shock. I'm you know at, at seeing you because you guys are the greatest athletes that go out there and do things that people can't do. But as you, you know, get comfortable and you're there a couple more years, it's not as exciting and, uh, you know, shocking for you to see some of these moves up and down the court. So you just kind of get more comfortable and get used to it. Right, right. And also, Tim, when you when you came into the league until what, right when you got out of the league, I'm, I mean, I'm sure 
you had a family pedigree. You know, your father was a referee. Uh, I don't know if any other siblings in your family were referees, or were they or not? Uh, actually, my uncle, Bill Yokes, uh, he was married to my mother's sister. So he was my uncle. So early on, I had a lot of people that I could go to, whether it was my father who was refereeing in the Final Four or Billy Oaks that really helped me understand, uh, you know, the concept of the game and, uh, you know, meeting other people, which helped me get through doors quicker than a lot of younger referees got through. All right. Well, we already got one question right there for you already. What NBA players in your career would you say you were starstruck by? Um, I like seeing David Robinson, and I'll tell you why. My first year in the league, uh, he was taking a jump shot, and I got caught in a bad position. And uh, I was looking right through his back, and somebody hit him on the elbow. He shot an air ball. There was an immediate timeout, and I didn't call the foul right in front of me. And he came out from the timeout. He said, you know, I got hit on the elbow. What happened there? I said, I apologize. You know, I got caught in a stack in a bad position and I missed it. And instead of giving me more grief or, or being a jerk, he tapped me on the back and he said, don't worry about it. You'll get it next time. You know, most <laughs> guys weren't like that. So every right. time I saw him, you know, with what he was and what he had accomplished in his life, you know, I always knew, you know, he was going to be professional and it was going to be, you know, somewhat fun. Right. Hey, Liv, no. while he on this, let me ask him something real quick. Go That's ahead. what I wanted to ask you about the human aspect of refereeing. Because I referee little kids. I referee some high school boys sometimes. But people don't understand the human aspect of it. Like, if a player is giving you shit out there, when you referee their games, you're going to get them shit, right? No doubt about it. Uh, you know, and this is no secret, but Rashid Wallace was real difficult with a lot of the referees. And we used to get in the locker room before the game and we used to bet $20 who could give him the technical foul. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, we knew, you know, he was going to start on somebody at some point and, and it never really took long, but I will say this. I've talked to him since, you know, uh, I've gotten out of officiating and, and he's really a good guy. He's, he's a great guy. And he just said, you know, when he stepped in those lines of that court, his competitive nature took over to the point where sometimes he kind of, you know, did things that he wished he didn't do. And, you know, you, you understood that, but I think he would have been a lot better of a player. And he was a great player if he would have kept his emotions in check a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So, so, so Tim, we always, as basketball players, we have this conversation all the time about the goat of basketball. Who is the goat of refereeing? Who is that guy that everybody seems to like and, 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 and he was that he was that dude? You no, know, as a referee, that guy for me was Joe Crawford because mm. he was from Philadelphia. I was from Philadelphia. There was a lot of guys that came in through that area and we all looked up to him because he was so successful. Um, but if, if you take the referees now, if you came in and did what he did, you would be fired within the first couple of years because he was just – out of control with technical fouls, throwing people out of the game, <laughs> acting like a fool. And nobody nobody wants that these days because people pay so much money to come see these people. So really it's now, you know, you have to get along with the players. You have to try to use your personality more in order to calm things down rather than just giving out quick technical fouls. And he kind of refereed with fear because everybody was scared to death of him. Even if he missed a call and it was blatant, they didn't want to go after him because they know he could throw them out immediately. And, you know, nowadays that, that definitely wouldn't fly. And it seemed like sometimes, man, he would spray you too, man, with all the spit coming out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, screaming, yelling, cursing. Yeah. At so, I mean, he, he could really, you know, get insane at times. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Here go another one. How was Dick Bavetta as a ref and a person? He seems like one of the best ever. You know, Dick Bavetta is total opposite of Joey Crawford in that he used his personality uh, in, in order to defuse situations. Uh, never, ever, rarely gave out a technical foul. He took pride in uh, not doing that, where Crawford didn't care to you up and throw you out of the game. He took pride in being able to defuse situations with his personality. Um, and that's the way they wanted the referees to evolve to in the last couple of years. So maybe Bavetta was a. Uh, you know, before his time and handling things that way. But, uh, you know, they, they really liked him and and he was successful at what he did. So who was your top five? Who's your, like we always do the top five players. Who was your top five refs? 
I think number one would have to be uh, Joe Crawford, Danny Crawford. Uh, Danny Crawford, a guy from Chicago, uh, great shape, knew the rules, uh, always had a calm demeanor on the floor. Uh, he just did, you know, an outstanding job. It seemed like every time he walked on the floor, I think you have to throw, uh, you know, Scott Foster in there, although he's a younger guy, he's been very successful. Uh, um, Pavetta would have to be in there. And, uh, you know, maybe a guy like uh, Duke Callahan or, or Steve Javi. I think Javi would be in there. Mm-hmm. He was another guy uh, that liked to give out a quick technical foul, but as he evolved in his career, he became a lot calmer too. So, you know, it, it's all about giving the league what they want and things changed as the game evolved and uh, you have to adapt to what they wanted in order to stay in the position. Wow. Wow. How effective is it to work officials to look at certain things that are flying under the radar in games, carries, hand checking, et cetera? And how difficult is it a ref of a team that is making it a point to play overly physical by the letter of the law, filing every possession? It's Ooh. difficult because the league wants the game to be freedom of movement up and down. Nobody wants to, again, go to these games and see a bunch of free throws. They want the up and down, high flying dunks, you know, jump shots. So uh, when a team is over physical, it, it is uh, difficult. You hope by blowing the whistle and putting certain players to the bench that new guys will come in and understand that you're not going to allow that and it opens the game up. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but, you know, the league really cracks down on physical play and, and hand checking and wanting it to be a game that's really free throwing, kind of like Golden State Warriors play in the sense that, you know, it's exciting basketball. And that's what I want to ask you, though, Tim, like we're reffing back in your day because the physicality was crazy. And now it's all finesse and pretty. And do, do you guys look at it like, man, those guys are getting a piece of cake now? It's a piece of cake now. You, you definitely look at it when I watch the games and see that it's uh, a lot less physical and, uh, you know, that it's up and down. And, you know, as long as you're in good shape as a referee, you love that. You're up and down the floor. The cop, clock keeps running. And the sooner you're out of there and hopefully there's no situations where you have to go back and fill out a bunch of reports. So, you know, the up and down basketball is definitely something that's better for everybody. Hold on, Tim. You say a bunch of reports. You got to file reports on stuff? You, you'd be shocked that after the game, uh, the you have to watch the tape and you have to fill out a lot of reports, especially if there's a lot of technical fouls or, God forbid, a fight. Mm. You're up till 2, 3 in the morning filling out different things and, and calling people and filling out a ton of reports. Wow. wow. That's crazy, right? That's crazy. But um, you get paid a lot of money doing that, though, don't you? Don't some of these referees make a lot of good money? Oh, yeah. I mean, you uh, – when I left there, I was, you know, making close to 400 grand a year when it came to everything. So it's definitely a, a job that pays well. You're away from your home a lot. There are a lot of lonely days on the road, but you have your summers off. So, right. uh, heck, if I could go back in time, I'd jump back on that bandwagon. Because, <laughs> <laughs> Tim, I don't know if I'd be that lonely on the road with 400,000, but that's right. another conversation. <laughs> You're looking at your bank account every day, you'd be okay. <laughs> So, so you saying you guys don't referee in the summer? So when they come out with these new rules, how do you how do you mandate that you doing it during the season? Like, if you get a new rule for the that year, how do you guys mandate that? You know, is it is it? I, I would assume it's hard. It is, but what happens is you go to a camp before the um, season starts, so you're at a week with every referee in the league at a hotel, and just from morning, noon, and night, you're going over plays, you know, on this big screen for everybody to see. And they tell you this is what the points of emphasis are. These are the rule changes. And then you have the preseason to make adjustments and, you know, make your mistakes and go through different things so that you will implement in when the regular season starts. Tim, what was the what was the uh the black official name? Was it Huey? Um you was Evans. There was Hugh, Hugh Evans. Evans. There you go. There you go. Uh, I remember him, man. He was a he was a he was a good dude too. Man. He was, and I think he just is is was up to get into the basketball hall of fame. And I don't know if it went through or not, but I know he was one of the nominations. And unfortunately, he just passed away yeah, uh, not that. too long ago. Yeah, I saw that. Here's the one I wanted to know this uh this gentleman. I, I don't think I ever heard Tim, of him. Tim, did you get the ref Earl Strong? 
No, he was actually he, he was out uh, probably three or four years, maybe more than that, prior to me getting in. But he was another guy that was from Philadelphia, and uh, he was along the lines of Joey Crawford. He was a high-tempered guy that really didn't take a lot of crap from anybody. But he was one of the legends of the game and one of the Philadelphia guys that a lot of people looked up to. Wow. Well, let's get into the nitty-gritty now, man. Let's get into the nitty-gritty of – you coming with your documentary and I love sharing that. your sharing your part what you saw and what you did was going on so let's talk a little bit about that first and then you got the documentary out so you can share that too with some of our listeners so if they didn't go see it then they need to go check it out okay oh man um you know the the documentary was done by Netflix uh the in the untold series operation flagrant foul and, um, you know, it just kind of talked a little bit about the three of us and what we did and how we did it and how I kind of fell into uh, being in a position that cost me a lot, it cost me my job, my marriage, uh, you know, a lot of um, difficult days in, in a federal prison. So um, it, it was unfortunate that I went th down those road. Um, and if I could turn back time, I certainly would. But we all know we can. And my mistake was put out there for the whole world to see. And it was difficult, but I had great family and friends that supported me. And, uh, you know, I got through it. And Tim, that happens too, man. Like that's what people don't understand. We are all human. We go, we make mistakes. You know, we get caught up in some, sometimes the wrong things that can get you in some big trouble or some things that can get you in small trouble. We, we all can get some kind of, <laughs> some kind of thing and got in some kind of trouble. And, Yes, no doubt. And and that's when I go and, and speak at either a college or a high school or, uh, you know, even grade schools that I've been to. I, I let people know how important the choices are you make in your life. And you really have to think before you make them because uh, they not only affect yourself, but people you love the most. And in my case, my family was, you know, devastated over it. So it was, it was difficult. But, you know, like I said, I, I had a lot of support. And, and for me, you know, things worked out and I was able to get back in a position where I can support my four daughters. I, I, uh, you know, I'm able to have breakfast with Marcus Liberty once in a while. So, you know, what else could I want? Right? I, what else could I want? And let me hop in and plus Liam, every time he called me, he, man, I'm just good through eating breakfast. I'm like, hey, man, I'm just waking up. Right. Hey, but Tim, I want to just speak to that, man. You, you have a lot of like, you a lot of like where we come from. Uh, you saw opportunity. You was like, oh man, I can make this on the side. Can you speak to the fact that people don't understand once you get into that, it becomes an addiction? No doubt. I, I started playing golf and going to the casinos and uh, gambling consumed my life. There wasn't one day where I wasn't gambling on something. And I, I enjoyed it. It gave me, you know, a high that other people got from drugs or alcohol. You know, I, mine was mine was gambling. So. Uh, it got to the point where I just started crossing lines that I shouldn't have been near. I didn't need the money, uh, but it was the the fun of the whole thing of going to the casinos, playing in big money card matches or, or golf matches, and just betting on sporting events. And then, you know, when I'm sitting at lunch and or a morning meeting, and I know an NBA team was put at an advantage or a disadvantage, or a relationship with a referee uh, and a player was going to affect the game. You know, I was, I was giving these people picks and what I didn't know is that they were betting millions of dollars on it. And then when we stopped, they wanted the picks to continue. And, you know, people that were associated with organized crime got involved. And, you know, I was I was in a bad spot. Wow. wow. Yeah, that's man. crazy. Crazy, man. Crazy. So you said you was doing a lot of gambling before. Was it before you got into the NBA? Or no. All, all after, once I joined, uh, you know, a couple golf country clubs and you're playing golf with the guys there in order to fit in, there's always, you know, bets and uh, they just got way out of hand. And I started hanging out with people that, you know, really enjoyed gambling at high stakes. And, you know, it spun out of control for me because I, I enjoyed it so much. Wow. wow. Yeah, because because gambling, man, I gamble. And, you know, Liv never gambled. I did all that other dark style. How are you going to say I never gambled? gambled. I gamble. I talked to you a hundred times a day. You gamble, but you wasn't you wasn't addicted. Man, I shot dice and everything, man. 
Okay, well, he was addicted too. So <laughs> <laughs> people don't know it's it's to chase. You can have all the money in your pocket, Tim, right? And it don't matter. I want all the other money too, right? Right, right. And it's funny when you know I, I kind of you know felt like when I had that inside information and and somebody was going to go out and you know make a call to help or hurt a player or. I knew that they were having relationships off the floor with certain coaches or players. I knew they were going to get the benefit of the call. So, um, you know, it only takes, uh, you know, two or three points, one or two calls, and you have an advantage. And, you know, with that being said, I knew the lines were off, and, and I was telling people, and they were uh, making millions of dollars betting on these games, and, and I didn't have a clue that they were making that much. And when I finally said I wanted to stop, it wasn't going to happen because the wrong people were making a lot of money. Ooh, man. Yeah, and we we're not gonna tell all the whole documentary, but I remember I remember a part in there when you when you said you kind of know what one of the referees, you know how he is out there on the court. So take this, take this game, because I know I know this ref is gonna make this call, these type of calls. Right. Yeah, we had uh, you know, Dick Pavetta was a good referee, but it was no secret. He said that, you know, the NBA put him on game sixes to make sure there were game sevens because that's what was great for the league. Uh, that was no secret. He said that many times. And, uh, you know, he also, uh, you know, was on a lot of those wow. big games where L.A. beat Portland in game six. Uh, L.A. beat Sacramento in 2002, that famous game. Oh, six. people are mad at that one, boy. Yeah. I mean, if you ask me, Sacramento should have a ring on their finger. And if it wasn't for – him officiating that game and and the things that they did to force that game seven, which they thought was going to go back to Sacramento and Sacramento was going to win anyway, and and they didn't. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's tough. They sh- they should definitely have a championship that year. Yeah, that was a squad. They had a nice team, man. Sacramento, I remember that boy. And then people still talk about that to this day. Right. So we got somebody on the timeline, Bob. What did that say? Did didn't some cheating go on in 2006 Heat Mavericks series? Yeah, that, was a, that, that was a famous series where, um, you know, Miami, I think, was up uh, or Dallas was up two games to none on Miami. And Miami came back and won that series um, and oh. it, it, in the championship. And they had that game where Bennett Salvatore called a lot of cheap fouls and Mark Cuban went through the roof. And, you know, what they do is, again, even if it's a championship series and the team's up, they start showing the referees plays mm. and they want these things to go six and seven games. So they start showing the referees calls that were missed in the previous two games. And they're always for the team that's down in the series and against the team that's up in the series. And what it does is it goes out there and puts a team on an advantage or a disadvantage. And it goes from two Oh to two, two instead of, you know, three Oh, so that there's plenty more things for the fans to tune in and look at It's It's all about money. Hey Tim, let me let me hop in real quick, Liv. Listen, we notice that even in the NBA playoffs right now, the best two players get the quick fouls, the two quick fouls. They get two quick ones on the road. Yeah, on on the road. On the road. Wild, it, it's funny. It's 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 amazing that even when I was there, there were certain referees that you knew didn't have the guts to make calls against the home team, and sometimes you felt like you were out there by yourself because they didn't want those 20,000 uh, people screaming and yelling and throwing shit at them. So, you know, <laughs> places, like, you know places like Portland Portland, and Sacramento were tough places to referee. So, you know, if you didn't have uh, enough guts to go out there and make calls against people like Bonzi Wells and Rashid Wallace in Portland, where, you know, they were telling you, listen, we're going to beat your fucking ass. <laughs> you know, they had a major advantage. <laughs> Tim, you looking over there like they thugs, but they ain't tough as me. I got the referee. I got the whistle. I can get right, it. Right, right. But trust Give me, I, I, I was chased out of there a couple times. Sometimes Rashid Wallace wanted to kill me. And if somebody didn't jump on him at the last minute, I'd probably still be eating the straw. <laughs> so 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 this is this is off the subject one one of our uh people are writing on our timelines uh hoop scoop he wanted to ask this question you are you are out of the game right now and i'm sure you're a fan of basketball what's your thoughts on kyrie irving drama 
was Kyrie Rome. And who was your I, favorite? I, I do. I do. I, I was a little bit disappointed by that because uh, here he is, an African American guy, and he talks about how his life growing up wasn't, um, you know, the way it should it should be, and uh, people did things to him and his his people that weren't right. And there he is, you know, doing something against, uh, you know, another group of people where um, he wants to support. He should want to support everybody else, and and. and after the fact, he, he still should have apologized and, and been told that, you know, he did something wrong and, and you know, make amends to it and at least admit it. But it seemed like he kept sticking to his guns and, and saying what he did, you know, really wasn't wrong. And I don't know if he watched that documentary no, or, or not. I personally didn't watch it, so I'm not sure what it was about. But obviously it, it hurt the Jewish community in a way where he shouldn't have supported it. Okay. So and then the last question was, who is your favorite player to watch now? Um, I guess, uh, you know, I, I always like to see, uh, you know, guys like LeBron James, um, you know, because he's at the point where he's most likely going to break the all-time scoring record in the league. And that's a feat that, you know, was tremendous uh, passing Kareem. And, uh, you know, I think that it's going to be good for the league. And, you know, he, he seems like somebody that, has a work ethic and, uh, you know, plays the game and plays the game hard and really doesn't take nights off. And he mm. seems like he really deserves it. So how do they pick the, the referees for a, a championship series, right? Is it seniority? Is it experience? Is it? It's, I think it's a little bit of both, but what they do is, uh, you know, they rate the referees one through 62 when I was there and the top 12 make it to the finals and, uh, you know, top 24, third round, 36, second round. Uh, so there's a, a system in place where they rate you. The coaches and general managers rate all the referees. They have a group of observers who rate all the referees. There's a uh, guy in the league office. At, when I was there, it was Rod Thorne and Stu Jackson rate the referees and also the supervisor of officials. And they take that and combine it and come up with a, a rating system, you know, one through 60. And and that's how they uh, evaluate you. But it does a lot of experience. You're not going to see a guy that doesn't have less than 10 years experience work deep into the playoffs. And you guys also, Tim, right, you have somebody in the stands observing and watching you guys too, right, perform while you're on the court each game, right? Yeah, the, every every arena has an um, a official observer who will watch every little thing you do. And, you know, you're, you're just supposed to be standing there <laughs> you know, during timeouts and, and before the game, uh, you know, looking for different things, you know, finding out who has, uh, you know, fouls, memorizing the scoreboard, making sure the clock's all right. So there's a lot of things that you're supposed to be doing that the observers look for. And if you're, you know, standing on the sideline flirting with some cheerleader or some girl, you know, he's going to write that down. You're going to get in I trouble. I'll be running so, down the listen, looking, right? Listen, Marcus could never be a referee. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like, what? <laughs> I missed that call. My bad. But I got her number. <laughs> I'm going to make the right call, too. Yeah. Hey, hey, Let Tim. me ask you something, Lib, about okay. the New York Pippin series, the New York Bulls series. When, when Mike went down that year, they said they cheated the Bulls for the Knicks to win that year. Didn't they cheat the Bulls? You know, that was uh, when I was real young. I really wasn't uh, – you know, a part of that at that time. So it, it's tough to say, you know, when I was there, I know when I came into the league, uh, Jess Kersey, who was one of the top referees at the time, I was refereeing a Bulls game and things were moving so fast. And I said something, he says, when Michael Jordan goes to the hole and he misses, I don't know if somebody hit him or not, but I'm blowing the goddamn whistle. Because he's so good, you know, so yeah, that, that was a lot of people's mindset that, you know, with a lot of the stars, they went to the hole, they went to the line, you know, if they missed the shot. That's why you see a lot of times a delayed whistle when you think somebody's going to make something and it, and it comes off and it's late because, you know, people are giving them the benefit of the doubt. And plus Kobe is say, hey, if you don't call it for him. <laughs> right. But, you know, Kobe and Michael were smart in that they never really blatantly went out and embarrassed the referee. They get you, you know, during a, a stoppage in play or a free throw, and they'd come up to you and say, hey, listen, you know, 
I don't know what the hell you were looking at, but I just got fouled down there. Don't miss it again. You know, never using language where you would be like, you know, hey, fuck you too. But you know, it, they used their personalities in a way where you wanted to give them a call. Oh, boy. Uh, so, so Ron Ron got a question. He says, Tim and Marcus, what is the ref's name that was when Bobby Knight threw the chair? Um, that was, was that, uh, Valentine? Valentine. that was Teddy Teddy Valentine. Yep, Teddy, he Teddy picked Valentine. that chair up and threw it across the, the court at him. You think he would have got suspended for the ref rest of the year for doing that, but man, he got away with murder, uh, you know, when he was at his peak as a college coach. Yeah, because I, I remember he, he did. did. He used to do a lot of the Big Ten games, too. I remember him, man. Uh, I wonder why he never got a – maybe he didn't. Maybe he just wanted to do college. You know, I it was thought- funny. He he was um, – he had a tryout with the NBA, and he got into a, a little bit of an altercation with a guy by the name of Bob Delaney, who was a uh, NBA ref. So they kind of think thought that he didn't have the personality to get along with different people. So they left him down at the college. But I think he would have been a, a good NBA referee. He really got – himself in real good shape after that and they never really gave him another shot but he's a good official he i think he would have been a great nba referee and then somebody ty rob has a question he said did the three-man crew hurt or help the game definitely help the game because if you look at uh you know the setup of nba referees you have a guy you know by half court a guy on the baseline and a guy over a free throw line extended and Mm -hmm. when you're uh you know, making that move down low and you curl away from that referee that's on the baseline, he's really blinded by the defender. So that third referee, foul line extended, has a real good open look to see that. So it definitely helps the game in that takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. And you're not running as hard as an, as an official because uh, you don't have to go as far of a distance when you have that third guy there. Tim, did you ever hear this? I don't know if it's true or not. They said – Kobe, they said Kobe Bryant used to study referees' positions where they had on the court, so he knew what kind of move he can do to get away with. Did you ever? Wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me because he seemed like he had every little thing covered. Uh, when you're really listening to him, you know, do interviews and talk and different documentaries about him, he really left no stern, uh, you know, uh, unturned. So um, it wouldn't surprise me at all. But I will tell you this, you know. Guys like him, as soon as they walked out onto the floor, the first thing a lot of these guys did, and you probably did this, Marcus, because you knew what officials, you know, you had a a rapport with where it was good or bad. So you could see facial expressions from certain guys coming out onto the floor, and they all look right at you, and it was either, oh, I'm going to have a good night tonight, or, man, I'm fucked. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm sure both of you guys, you know, remember going into certain games and seeing certain referees and thinking, yeah, man, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get the benefit of anything tonight. And then you're going to also think, oh man, this guy's, a, I, I like this guy. He's a good guy. I'm going to, I'm going to go to the hole and I'm going to get that foul. I won't get if somebody else was here. What's that yeah. with CP3 and the official though, Lib? Uh, CP3 got it going with some official every game he reps. Yeah, that, that's Scott Foster, who, uh, you know, I was very good friends with when, uh, you know, I was in the NBA. He was the godfather of my daughter. I was the godfather of his son. So he's he's a guy that is the number one referee in the league right now, can basically do no wrong, a little bit cocky, a little bit arrogant, and uh, is able to get away with this. But there's going to be a time where he, you know, starts on the downtrend and stuff like that's going to get him in a lot of trouble because uh, it, it's just like coaches in the NBA. The, the players are the show, right? Mm-hmm. So the league doesn't want any problems with – referees and uh, players. And at some point it's going to get him into trouble when he, when he gets in altercations with star players like that. Mm. And how, how hard was it to referee Shaquille O'Neal? Cause he was so dominant. He was, he was, he was so dominant, so big and so strong. And uh, you know, the, the flopping was so big. So guys knew that, you know, they could flop and, and fool a lot of referees and Shaquille was so big and so strong he didn't really need to hit somebody hard to send them flying into the first row. Um, but the thing, the thing with Shaquille was if you could give him the benefit of the doubt, you were going to, number one, because he was a star, and number two, because he was a good guy, right? So it would be different if he was, a, he was a jerk off, but he was a good guy. So he was difficult to officiate, but, you know, you really have to make sure you weren't giving him fouls 
from people flopping because, again, the last thing you want to do is send a star like him to the bench where people come to see him play. <laughs> Tim, this is going to be funny, man. Because, Tim, how tall are you? Uh, five nine and a half, five okay. ten. If I have my orthotics in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a fight breaks out. Have a fight ever broken out with with you refereeing the game? A, a Shit, game? I I officiated the malice at the palace. You talk about a fight. yeah. There was not only players wanted to fight, but fans were fighting. It was it was you crazy. that game? Oh yeah! Wow, I did not know that. Yeah, you talk about staying up all night filling out reports. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, that took two weeks. Yeah. Oh, I almost man. missed my flight the next morning. Wow. Wow. So you had to break that one up. Wow. That was crazy. There was nothing they could do. Right. You had. No, there really wasn't. But no. I get what you're saying, Marcus. 5'9", uh, 5'10". Five, five, I'm in there with guys like you, 6'9", six, 6'10". Six, but you're hoping that when you get in there, the players respect the officials to the point where they're not going to take a swing at you or accidentally hit you. And most of these guys don't want to fight anyway. It's all a bunch of, you know, show. Only guy um, I really knew that always wanted to fight was uh, the guy in uh, New York, went from New York in Chicago. Um, uh, what was the guy? I always wanted to fight Barkley. In Chicago? Yeah, he, he was Oakley? in he, Oakley. Yeah, they oh, said every Oakley. time uh, – Barkley and was going to play Oakley. He came up, up with some type of injury and sat out the game because Oakley always wanted to beat the piss out of him. <laughs> <laughs> he did. Wow. I, I remember, wow. I remember wow. that. Do you remember that, Bob? Yeah, man. Oakley don't like Charles Barkley. He no. always felt like he was a uh, overrated. You know, they pumped him up and they felt like he was a sissy, right, Tim? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But and Oakley was tough, man. He he was he liked he to was. get in there and bang. Yeah, he he liked to fight. Man, look, I was just at Tim Hardaway's thing, and he tried to get him to come up and say some words. He was like, "Nah, we ain't gonna mess with Oak. We know Oak can come up here with ball eyes." Well, we <laughs> saw, what, a couple years ago, he was still still wanted to fight nine security guards <laughs> in National Square Garden, <laughs> and he was winning. <laughs> <laughs> the Oak Tree wasn't no joke, man. He wasn't no, no joke. Oh, but Tim, man. don't you think, man? Like even on the like the youth AAU you know, travel ball, high school circuit, right? You have referees. And I don't know if they experience referees or not, but I see it all the time as a as a fan and sometimes I'm coaching uh, that referees sometimes let the game get out of control. And then when it's gotten too big, and then the fights and the people from the stands and this and that, how can a referee control that situation? Just explain that to some of our listeners. Through experience, and you have to understand something. If you're at the high school level, okay, if these referees were any good, they'd be in college, right? And if they were real good, they'd be in the program for the NBA. So you're dealing with officials that probably don't have a lot of experience and don't know how to do that yet. So they have to get that experience and get that training from guys that are above them and unfortunately, at that point, they don't. So they don't know how to get a game that's out of control, back under control without, you know, having a lot of problems and coaches and the fans being upset. So it's really a, a, an art form that you have to learn through a lot of experience. And mm -hmm. again, if they were uh, experienced and good, they wouldn't be refereeing at that high school level. Yeah, because we see it all the time, right, Bob, that a, fan, a, a parent to come out and – like jump on the ref. <laughs> you know, I, right. I, like I haven't mean, reached his level, but I referee, you know, I ref some games. And and one thing that I understand is like you have to build a, a rapport with the fans too. You know, right. step over to the side. Hey man, my bad. I missed that one. Man, but you know, I gotta fit, you know, you gotta kind of like, man, we working this to the best of our ability. You can't make it to like, man, shut the fuck up, right? Right. But the, the thing that you just said is the key. If if you're refereeing a game and you know you made a call that may not be right right the worst thing you can do is puff up your chest and get in an argument with that coach or that player if you say to them hey you know what i'm not too sure i i i got that one right right maybe maybe the next time i'll take i'll think you know another look at it i'm gonna give no you a player. makeup yeah no player or a coach is going to come at you and start screaming and yelling and cursing at somebody that says, listen, you're probably right. Maybe I didn't get that one right. It, right. Like you said, we're all human. We make mistakes and certainly in a fast paced game, but you don't want to be using that two or three times to the same person, you know, 
in, in right. a game because they're, then they're going to say, well, you fucking suck. You shouldn't be doing this. If you're <laughs> you're false. Hey, my right. favorite kickback phrase was always, man, I owe you one. You know, right, I, right. I owe you one. Because right. coaches, referees give makeup calls. Right? Absolutely. You're really not supposed to say it's a makeup call. And, you know, the, the, the NBA will say there's no such thing as makeup calls, but it's certainly, you know, without a doubt. You call <laughs> cheat one down one end, someone's pissed. You go down that other end. You damn sure better give them that one and get them to the line, or they're going to really fall. <laughs> well, another one of our guys, Ty Rob, wants to know. He says, "Tim, have you opened a official academy?" No, or uh, you know, basically, I'm out of uh, you know officiating basketball. Unfortunately, with the mistakes I made, you know, um, I'm not a part of that anymore. There's a lot of great uh, officials that have great camps that a lot of people go to that learn from. And, you know, unfortunately I'm not, you know, involved in any of that. Right. But you're doing real estate right now, right? Yeah. I was lucky out. that um, when I got in trouble and I came out of prison, uh, you know, I got involved at the right time where nobody wanted to buy real estate and I just kept buying, buying, buying and fixing them up. And I'm fortunate enough now to own several rental properties. So, uh, just a little bit of luck, uh, you know, a little bit of grace from God. I think he felt like maybe uh, it was time to, you know, give me a second chance. And I was fortunate enough to uh, get involved in a business that took off. Yeah, uh, I was watching saying. the documentary, man. I was like, okay, that's a good move. And and, and let me ask you one more thing. Um, they called you Elvis, though. They How did. did you laugh about that, though, right? Yeah, it was funny. They called me Elvis because uh, the guys in the mob won so much. They said I was Elvis, the king. I was the king, <laughs> king of giving them NBA picks. So wow. They, they never used my name. They, you know, they would refer to me as Elvis. Wow. Wow. I, I watched the documentary like eight times this weekend over and over because it was But I, I may I may tell people in the future it's because I was so good looking. I reminded them of Elvis. So <laughs> 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 I want to get a video camera with you and Liv at lunch at, at breakfast. All that. Oh no, nah, man! Nah. <laughs> it can't, it, it's not for TV, is it, Liv? No, it's not for TV. All the waitresses stop when he comes in and they look at it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, too. Hey, they go to this one spot, man. Him and him and my him and our other buddy, man. He they 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 eat there pretty much. Do y'all go every day or every week? Not every day. Too? Probably two two three times a week we go there yeah. and. Then, uh, we discuss what we need to do, yeah. you know, for that day with the real estate. Yeah. So when they invite me, Bob, every two two years they invite me. You know? <laughs> so, so Liv, I, you be up early, man. You live hits me early. But yeah, Mark, Marcus was uh, helped. Uh, his, his name's Basile. His son Adam is a, a pretty good college basketball player yeah. at Concordia. Uh, Marcus trained him, and he's got a pretty good jump shot, and uh, he's getting a lot better. He gets a little stronger. I think he's really yeah, going to be I good. I agree. So. A lot of credit you. to him for uh, training him and getting him in the position to get a good college scholarship out of it. Yeah, well, I agree. So. I agree. To all of you breaking news, Nets hire Vaughn. Jacques Vaughn is head coach over at Udoka Thoughts. They couldn't give Udoka that job. They say um, Adam Silver stepped in and stopped that. I read that too, and I, I believe that. I think there's a lot of times that I used to hear stories about um, David Stern stepping in when it came to different coaches and and there's no doubt in my mind they stepped in. I don't know what the, you know, behind the scenes things were uh, with that, but I'm sure it was a lot that nobody knows about that took place that uh, I don't think we're ever, we won't see him for a while uh, coaching. At least, you know, at least two or three years, probably. Exactly. Yeah, you know, somebody yeah. have to bring him in in a, uh, you know, a role of being an assistant coach. And when things yeah. go bad, he'll, he'll step in and get a second chance, but it's going to take a while. Yeah. Right. They couldn't bring him in at the top after that. They like, oh yeah, no, no, hell yeah. no! You just, you just I, I think I think Vaughn will do a good job. I mean, I think he's off to a two and one start. I I think he's a guy that's respected and has had a long career. I, I think he he will do well. So who you got? Who you got winning this year? Who who who's your team? You know, I, I think you have to stay with the uh, Golden State Warriors when somebody can move the ball, get up and down the floor like that, and shoot yeah. the way they do. It, it's tough to beat a team like that. I know they're off to a little bit of a slow start. Uh, I just don't think when you look at Milwaukee that, um, you know, with, with uh, you know, the one star that they have that, that they, he can carry everybody on their back. I think Golden State just has too many different people that can step in and put some big numbers up on the board. So 
you know, to me, I think Golden State's still the team. Okay, okay, I agree. What was your favorite when you when you was in Chicago, Tim? When you guys went when you went referee in in, in Chicago, what was one of your favorite uh, restaurants to go to? You know, we stayed at that Hilton right there at the airport, and there was a guy there that uh, would give us everything for free. So we we never left that hotel. <laughs> Referees are cheap, man. So when, when you're there and you could get everything, especially when you know some guys drank 20 beers the night before the game, you know, and they got that barbell taken care of. They didn't want to step out. Plus, it was cold during the basketball season. Nobody. But wants to but, but Tim, time. but but Tim, y'all got per diem, right? Heck yeah, we got two hundred and thirty dollars a day when I was there. That's what I'm saying. So y'all didn't want to spend that. You can't. It wasn't that. They I'm just gave it to me. Leave that hotel. <laughs> <laughs> you know the good thing about Chicago, you could get there. You could go underground from the airport to that hotel, never step foot outside. So yeah, uh, you know, in in the winter, you know, especially in Chicago, you didn't want to go out in that cold. He weather. talking about the hill at O'Hare. You yes. talking about O'Hare? Yes. Yeah. Is it true that David Stern banned Michael Jordan out for them two years because of gambling? It's always been a myth. You know, I, I honestly think that Michael Jordan was so big to the league, such a big star, that uh, I don't believe that to be true. I think that they would have found another way to cover that up or sit him down and try to tell him to stop. Uh, I just think he was too valuable uh, mm -hmm. for them to really put a ban on him. I think something would have come out by now that if that was really the case and that happened. Wow. Oh, so Tim, did you write that book? Did you help write the book too or no? Was yes. That book personal foul that I wrote, um, I wrote in prison. So oh. uh, I had a job in the kitchen. I think it was about five or six hours a day. I had to be up at four o'clock in the morning. So, uh, you know, after I got done, I'd go to the library every day and, and I'd write the book and, and mail it back and forth to home. Uh, you know, my mom would type it up real nice and neat and send it back to me. And then we'd send it uh, chapter by chapter to the publisher. So oh. once I got out, you know, we, we published it. Okay. Wow. Okay. And the name of that book again. So people, if yeah, they the want book's to go. called Personal Foul. Personal Foul. Wow. Personal Foul. Wow. That's wow. nice. I got I to gotta go get that book because everybody said that book is pretty good. That the documentary is, they said it was good, but the book was really good. That's what, that's what one of my guys was telling me. Yeah, I got a copy in the car. The next time I see, I'll give it to you. All right. Yeah. Man, that's that's big time, man. So, Bob, anything else you want to share? Any anybody else got something for? Our, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Tim Duncan. He had it with a, uh, an official. Who was that official that tech Tim Duncan? He was sitting on the bench. He kicked him out the game. Who was right. That? that was that was Crawford. Remember when uh, <laughs> they were in Dallas and he didn't even say anything and Crawford <laughs> asked him if he wanted to fight him. He was going to fight him right there on the floor. And <laughs> And we, we all thought Crawford was actually suspended for the rest of the year. For that? For that incident. And we thought he was done. And they yeah. actually brought him back. And everyone said that he had pictures of David Stern with farm animals somewhere because they couldn't believe that they gave him his job back. <laughs> wow. Because he was in so much trouble that, you know, that was like the final straw. And they thought he was never coming back. And for some reason, they had him go to counseling and anger management. And they brought him back the next year. Wow. David Stern with farm animals. Yeah. <laughs> so you had to have something on him to get right. back in. Yeah, he had something. I don't know what it was. <laughs> wow. Oh, man. Oh, boy. I love it, man. I so, Tim, you're you you, you you're chilling now, man, making, you know, major moves on the real estate game. And you're going you're gonna to help me get my uh, sports facility, too, man, since you're in the real estate game. We, we, I'm no doubt. And, and uh, there's a lot of people that are saying that in this Sarasota area, you know, it would, it would go over big, especially with somebody like yourself and, you know, the things that you've already done in the community here that people talk about and, uh, you know, what you've done with the kids and, and training a lot of these kids that have been pretty good basketball players. So, yep. you know, yep. I think for sure it would be a huge success. Absolutely. Yeah. But well, Tim, we're not gonna hold you up, man. We know you you you're busy, but we definitely wanted to get you on, man. And I know you watch all ball Chicago, so man, absolutely. Uh, we really appreciate that, man. I appreciate you guys having me. I really do. Thanks a lot, guys. And look, right. Tim, I know you watch it just for me, man. So I appreciate that too, bro. You got it. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Have a Tim good night. Tim, the right, building, Tim. baby. I'll see you. I'll see you, Let's man. go. Let's go. <laughs> oh, man. 
Oh, man, that was a good one, bro. Yeah, man. Tim was a, man. <laughs> I can't a, stop a, laughing, bro. A good dude, man. Like, I I, I literally sit down and eat breakfast with him and uh, another one of our guys. I train his son in basketball. And uh, it's been it's been a, it's been it's been nice just chatting with him, man. And it, it wasn't even about, you know, the other stuff that he did. No, you know, no, I think I mean, people, I think people, man, some people deserve a second chance, man. And, um, uh, and, and, and make some, make some, a living, you know, it's just like with, with the, with the drug dealers, we talk about when they get locked up and they don't get no help, no kind of help or guidance. Yeah. And then they end up doing the same thing, you know, and, and, and end up repeating, you know, that cycle. Yeah. We have Cheryl Cook coming on next Wednesday. Give us a little something about Cheryl Cook. What, what is she? Well, she I know she played on the USA team, and I think at one year she one season she probably led the nation in scoring. And if she wasn't, she was definitely top top five in the nation in scoring. Uh, she went to uh, Cincinnati, uh, played. Uh, actually, it was one of my King Jaguar guys down at the same time she was there. Uh, Ramil Shorter. Uh, so she, this she was, was gonna, in track and field and baseball. Wow! So this wow. was going to be a, this was going to be a dandy man. She's I think she's from Indianapolis. She's from Indiana. Indiana, yeah. yeah, and and definitely you know one of our our I think hoop scoop right hoop yeah, ball hoop scoop. scoop. Shout out to hoop scoop. Hoop scoop man. got got us uh, to to get her to come on. We just want all types of. Athletes, basketball players in particular, because this is what we we do. But it can be football players, baseball players, um, and I think she would have a story to share with some of our our listeners. Oh, she played with Lynette Wood, Woodward too, man. Wow, that's crazy. And that, and I think Lynette was one of the first females. To, I think I don't don't quote me on it. One of the first. Harlem Grove Trotters, and, and they saying Cheryl Cook, she was one of the Harlem Grove Trotters too. Wow. wow. So this is going to be interesting, man, when, when we have her on. We're going to chop it up with her. Make sure you tune into that one next Wednesday, right? Next, next Wednesday. Wednesday. Hey, next but I want to say this, though, uh, while everybody watching, though. I want to give a shout out to my man, Liv, though. And I always do, but I, I want to just tell you, bro, I put a post up the other day. It was like, personality sells your service better than your service, right? So we've had all ball Chicago. And let's say 90% of the people that have come on has been relationships that you've been able to acquire over the course of your career. And it speaks to who you are. It speaks to who, what you have, the way that you carried yourself, how we've been able to have the success for this show, man. Because everybody come on, love the hell out you. And I know you. You're not that lovable, dude. <laughs> but for real, though, man, I just want to tell you, man, you did something right over the course of your career. I want to continue to let you know that, brother. Because man, these all, dudes, I don't know these dudes. These people. It's all up. It's all about the upbringing, man. From my from my parents to my my siblings to my to my neighborhood, the people in my neighborhood, you know, show me mad love. That's all I know, man. I don't even know how to hate, really. I don't even know how to put people down because that's not what my tongue is all about, you know. And and shout out to you, Eric Eric Johnson, too, man. He he we we come on uh every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and that's 12 p.m. Central Time. So that's what time we rock every Wednesday. We gonna rock that because we don't want to confuse people and keep dropping shows. <laughs> some people, some people get mad. Get he like, man, what time do the show come on, man? Yeah, yeah. He said that. <laughs> he said that. Like Tim, Tim said that one time. We he he texted me. He said, "Oh man, I missed it. You guys were coming on for a while at twelve, and then you switched it on me." Right, yeah, we so, was. Yeah, we sometimes so I, you will call me in the morning, man. You want to hop on? Yeah, so we shout out to your boy Bo Rab, man. He said, Man, very good documentary, great show, fellas. Man, that's your boy Bo Rab. He always checking out Ty Rob. Shout out to Ty Rob. I just want to get these people, man. Thanks for y'all tuning in. Don, who that's my man, Calhoun, baby. Calhoun, another one of my king Jaguar brothers, man. Uh, Tyree Cooper, my man. 
Uh, and we're going to do something big for King, man. We're bringing all the King legends back one more time. And then and we just got to give y'all y'all roses because y'all school is no longer functioning at the high level that it used to. But Lord knows that it's a plethora of history out here. And we got to do something big for King, man. And King no, High School, y'all need to bring everybody back that did some of the retired jerseys. Yeah, but that's a lot of high schools, too. You know, a lot of high schools, they forget about some of the people who paved the way for that next generation to come through and do that thing, you know. Okay, I'm going to mention the high school. Do you tell me a name that's synonymous with that high school? How Jordan. far? Uh, Gerald Haywood, man. Kenwood. Uh, spell. Is it Speller? Yeah, Speller. Okay, Dunbar. Uh, Dunbar. True. I got a I got a couple of guys, man, that I know okay. from there. So okay, Robles, but I, one more. But I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Alonzo Skanes, uh, Donnell Nicholson uh, for Dunbar. I'm going. I'm going. To people like you know. Okay, got, you gonna get Keeps calling. Crane. 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 Anthony Manuel. Marshall. Marshall. Fred Marshall. Julian. Julian Irvins. Byron Irvins. Uh, Corliss. Corliss. Now that one's that's a tough one on me, but I'm gonna go with my big fella. George Montgomery. Okay, George Montgomery. Harlan. Harlan. Uh oh. <laughs> you got you me can't think of nobody but Harlan. You got, but you, you, but, but you, but you, you, but what you said is all these schools had legends to come yeah, from. Yeah, yeah. So they all deserve their roses. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but man, it's hard though, Bob, man, to to do it because, like, I'm thinking. <laughs> I know, I know somebody that was hooping at Harlem. I just, my man, I guess can't get it. I can't get the name hey, right now. I said uh, they should retire the numbers from Ke uh, from King Kevin Haywood said. There would be no numbers left. Melissa <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. got a question, Bob. For us. she says, college basketball has started. Who who you liking, and what players are on your radar? And Marcus, you should have your nephew Javon on the show one day. Definitely, Javon is a shy kid, though. I mean, it's hard to get that kid to even talk. Uh, but definitely we we'll try to get him on. I'll try to get him on. Ah, that's right. Daryl Walker went to Corliss, didn't he? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, Daryl Skywalker, man. How well, a couple of kids that I'm peeping at uh, at college, they hometown kids. Uh, Namari Barnett, he's at Alabama. Uh, Lance, Lance Williams, I want to say Lance, he's over at uh, SIU. Uh, Antonio Reeves, he's at Kentucky. Kentucky. Um, my boy, uh, Ray J. Dennison, he's at, uh, damn, what school Ray J. at? He's at Tulsa. I think he had Tulsa. So, and, the, and, the, and the one kid is at UCLA. He's at Chicago one too, right? Uh, Amar or Bailey, isn't he? Bailey. Bailey, he's at um, uh, UCLA. Yeah. And, and there's so many more. Lefty boy, we need Lefty boy don't here to tell everybody. I know, man, boy. Because he lefty, knows all of them, man. Yeah. For those who don't know who Lefty B-Boy is, man, make sure you check out my man Lefty too, man. Number man, love for Chicago Chicagoans who's doing it, man, helping our youth, spreading the word. He's got programs. He's doing a lot of things, man. Out there on the south side, uh, Lefty B Boy, Kevin, and, and Kevin Haywood. Up, and before we get up out of here, Chicago, I want y'all to know it is not always as bad as the way that they put it out there. The uh, the news is always over ampl over amplifying the violence, all the over amplifying the gangs, the drugs, and all that. But it's not always the case. You know, they gotta have news to report. We are gonna be okay, y'all. We're gonna be all right in Chicago. Well, you know, Pooh jumped on. Pooh said, Robert, I watched your 1980s and 90s show with the young lady and the older man. Robert, how many shows you got? Much love. Can't wait to see Cheryl Cook. Ah, uh, yeah, man. You know, we're going to keep it cracking. I see Hoop Scoop said, Rob, that Mark Aguirre live in the garage classic. When, when do you, do you get an NBA star in the garage? <laughs> like that. <laughs> when it's free food and beers, baby. No, and, that was, and that was our guy. That was our guy spot, too. Uh, mm -hmm. Legend. Yeah, Tracy Ice. Dildy. Tracy and, Dildy and, was the orchestrator of all that. And Mark and Mark is good friends with uh with Rob and and myself. So Mark, yeah. Mark is all about, you know, showing up and and, and talking and, and doing yeah. all that good stuff and, and eating. Yeah. It's it's good to have a, a bas some basketball fellowship when you can just sit down, be yourself, eat, 
talk a little trash, talk a little basketball, talk a little history. It's good to do that type of stuff, man, because some people may have thought you forgot about them. So when you start talking about them and you're bringing their name up, they're like, oh, they remember me. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You know and there's so many of y'all, man. And, and and all of you guys deserve your roses, man, because let's just say, let's be honest, man. Chicago always gets a bad rap for so many things. But yet everybody flying to Chicago to come downtown, eat our food, come to the lakefront, hang in Navy Pier. They want to go on Magnificent Mile. You know what I'm saying? They want to go miss it. Everybody loves Chicago. Man, we gotta and we gotta watch that stuff too, man. When we eating too, man. Uh, I'm just saying that for, for as the older we get, that food is not burning off the way it used to. I agree. Right. So we gotta make sure we. Oh, somebody said uh, Ron. Ron said, explain what Tracy was saying and what Mark was saying, Robert. Uh, you are talking about uh, as in far the garage as well. when y'all was? Well, in the I garage. know Tracy said. Tracy said he's taking Mark Aguayo over Charles Barkley. Carl Malone, Tim Duncan. He said none of them wanted to see Mark Aguirre. That's what Tracy said. Is that what you talking about? And, and then they said Tracy was saying Mark going to the Pistons messed up his points. Well, you know what? Mark still averaged 15. And if you can put Vladi Divac in the uh, Hall of Fame, he, he didn't average 15 over the course of his career. Mark averaged, Mark averaged them at 29 for seven to eight straight years in Dallas. Sitting that so y'all was, so y'all was talking about the Hall of Fame situation. Well, yeah, yeah, that's what uh, uh, Tracy Dilty said. Him going to Dallas messed up his Hall of Fame. <clears throat> he said it didn't benefit nobody. Not Dallas, but Isaiah but Detroit. Tyler. Not I mean, Dallas, Detroit. Detroit. Yeah. Uh, Detroit. Tracy said only only person that benefited was the uh, Isaiah Thomas when Mark was to uh, Detroit. Oh, so we just got a, a baseball guy, uh, my boy Bo Rab. Bo Rab want to come on on our show, man, and talk. Let's go, show. Bo. Let's go. Bo Rab is a oh, so 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 Bo, we gonna get you on, man. We can't get you on this Wednesday because this Wednesday coming up, we already have somebody, but we definitely can get you on that next one, Bo, because we know you know some of those. Man, we can do a we can do players. a Monday or we can do a Friday with both. No, man. we can't. We can't mess it up, Bob. We just said we can't mess the time up. But now you look at you you're jumping all bonus. over the place. We can't you, do the you, bonus. You, you're jumping all over the damn place, man. <laughs> uh, Kevin Haywood, he said he think Mark Aguirre gonna be next next year. He gonna be in there next year. Man, you I know hope what? So. I was at uh Tim Holloway's thing and I saw Mark. Just very few guys at that level would have showed up to that, knowing that your little brother going into the hall before you. And I told Mark, man, I, I I ran up to him like a kid. I said, man, I'm so proud, man. I just love you so much, man. You didn't have to come, bro. You didn't have to be here, Mark. You could have been like, man, I ain't in there, man. Fuck this. You excuse my language, y'all. But he could have took the. He could have said that. He was like, yeah. no, nah, man, Tim, that's my little bro, man. I'd like if any one of my little bros who went in there, if you yeah. went in there. And yeah, that's so what I, the gatekeepers I, about, bro. I really think, and, and that's just me speaking. Mark Aguirre should be in the Hall of Fame, you know. Um, I also think, you know, if you really look at the numbers, Terry Cummins. T TC a, should be in there. Yeah, man, he had a hell of a career. Terry you know? Cummins should absolutely be in the Hall of Fame, man. And I think Terry right now, he's doing his documentary. He's doing all that. So they're making a bid, man, to get to it. And him and Mark right. definitely deserves it, man. I mean, those, those guys – was like our Mount Rushmore's growing up in the urban community, man. The DePaul Blue Demons when we grew, that's all we had. Yeah. So I and I get them guys when I see them, I still act like a kid. Like no, man, that's what, what, but what that's what. It, but that's what it was, man. Think about it. That's what was around us, you know. Mm -hmm. High school basketball, DePaul. Yeah, that was it. You know, yeah. I I don't, I don't even when I was a shorty, I don't even really remember watching Illinois. Right, but I know we watched some DePaul, you know, we watched some DePaul Blue Demons and 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 watching how those Chicago kids that was on that squad representing the city. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what was intriguing to me that seeing yeah. a Mark Aguirre, seeing a, a Skip Dillard, you know, seeing those guys that was from our hood, you know, playing lacing them up and they on television. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we and then Turn around after the season, see him at Chicago State. <laughs> right. Walk right up to him. Yeah. So, yeah, man, it, we're going to keep this show going, man, because I tell you what, I enjoy it. I enjoy doing it with you. I enjoy meeting all these people. And basketball is just such a therapeutic. Yeah. It helps with stress. Yeah. 
No, you know, I, agree. I agree, man. I and agree. I still got the Lakers turning it around this year and winning the title. No, I'm man, you a fool. You, a fool. <laughs> you lost. You you lost your mind for real. <laughs> that ain't gonna happen. That ain't gonna no, happen. Man, man John man. Solly said. John Solly said. Bron ain't gonna break that record. You see that? Say what? John Solly. He was on um Shannon Sharp show. Uh -huh. And he said, LeBron is not gonna break Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's record. He said, Phil Jackson held Kobe back from breaking Wilt Chamberlain's record. He said, some records are made, made to not be broken. So who's going who's gonna to stop him? Darvin Ham? <laughs> Come on. Uh, that broke-ass jumper he keeps shooting. He keeps shooting that damn broke-ass three. <laughs> he ain't going to never win. Hey, I love Brown, but y'all ain't going to make me think Brown is a pure shooter. I'm not doing that. Now, Kenny wants to ask a question, and I guess this will be the last one that we get up out here. He said, did we, it? yeah, I'll post it. Do y'all see Isaiah Thomas want Michael Jordan to say sorry? Why is Isaiah? Hey, Kenny, that was fake, man. That was all fake news. Somebody put that together. Did you see that? No, I didn't see it. That's why I was like, that was a shock to me. Yeah, somebody put that fake thing up there with Isaiah saying, I'm going to hold this against you until you apologize. Yeah. That ain't even how Chicago dudes work, man. I mean, you know, no, because I, I, because I would say Isaiah would have came out publicly and said that on some outlet, you know, if that yeah. was the case. But we know that's not the case. Uh, Chicago State games, yeah, that was they were good. Yeah, we had a bunch of legendary coaches, man. And, and let's talk a little bit about that before we go, Bob. That and 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 I think this what. The problem is sometimes, I'm not saying all the time, but most of the time mm -hmm. in Chicago, we had, I know when I was growing up, we had uh, Michael Clark. We had Ham, rest in peace. Mm -hmm. uh, I had Hope, uh, who was Robert Reed. He's the Robert Reed, you know, but he was like, he's the real Robert Reed and you the fake one. <laughs> no, no, the real one is on the Brady bus. <laughs> <laughs> but, but 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 my point was, those guys that I mentioned was big on fund fundamentals, right? Mm -hmm. So they would teach me, you know, a lot, and a lot of other guys, you know, the fundamentals, and we were being taught, man, a lot. Mel Davis too. I can't I can't forget about Mel Davis uh, because I did go to some of his camps too over there on Forty Seven in Lake Park. Uh, that he had a camp going. But those four guys that I came in contact with actually taught me the game when I was a shorty. So when I went on to play at King High School, I already had the fundamentals. So people used to always say, well, man, Cox, Cox didn't need to teach me no fundamentals because I already had it, you know. Right. But if you're not with somebody like that, and that's what I'm at to, 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 to today's generation, if you're not with somebody that's actually teaching you the fundamentals, it's going to be hard for you to sustain your basketball career mm -hmm. because your fundamentals will get you through when everything else is on the way on that downward spiral spiral. You know what I mean? I agree. So, so we need more guys that's teaching the game the right way and not just, I, I saw a guy on, on, uh, on social media the other day, Bob, it was so funny. He was like, man, you don't need to be doing all that uh, crossing the blah, blah, blah. He said, that's a move of instinct. Like, you don't just do that move just to be doing it. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> agree. I was, I was laughing at him because it was so true, right? But yeah. that's because these guys, they go to these, you know, super, I call them super, you know, trainers, uh, trainers super trainers. They teach them euros. Man, teaching them all that, man, all that. You can't teach that. You know, so. So, but they, but but they paying them the big bucks to do that, you know. So if you're not teaching that, they probably don't even mess with you. You're not finna teach. You can't teach the euro. It's <laughs> one of those instinctive things. You can't yeah. teach the crossover. You either have it or you don't. Yeah, man, it's 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 crazy. But yeah, your boy Hoop Scoop say, "No, nah, fellas, Isaiah Thomas quote is real. It's on all the credible sports outlets. Maybe he said it, but he didn't write it." <laughs> he did not write that but you know what him and Michael man that's something they they two grown men they don't need each other for absolutely nothing so they don't have to get along they don't have to like each other 
they don't even have to cross paths because Michael is not around like that. So Kenny, Kenny said, hey, Kenny said, man, I hope y'all promote that Cheryl Cook show. She could ball. I will, I will definitely spread the word for next week. Keep in touch. We don't need no cancellations. <laughs> we not gonna cancel on this end. If everything is working on our end, she's in on our show. It's that's what we have problems on the other end from our our guests that we can't go live because something is right not right with their on their end. So we can't go live most of the time, but. Pretty much that that's their fault. You know, on they Yeah, Dig DC, man. Dig C DC got an Android. Now I ain't gonna get her head on here to protect herself. But everybody was calling me about that DC show. All my guys from the hood. Man, Bob, you don't know DC, man. He real as hell, Bob. Man, there ain't no DC with that cool. I was like, oh, that's my man. <laughs> <laughs> now that's Liz, man. I told him, but they were like, they never get a chance to see the human side of of guys, you know, and that's right. what this show does, man. And people say when they come on here, they get to tell they look like they relax. Yep, yep, yep. But Kenny, we definitely gonna promote it. We actually gonna probably put it out tomorrow, so then you can share it with your, you know, with your peeps uh, throughout the internet and uh, on your social media platforms as well. Uh, because I, I've been hearing a lot of great things about her, so I, I can't wait. I can't wait for that one. Danny said. Bob, you know when he coached at Ariel and we beat Busy, how did they how how did the parents act? Oh man, I was at that game for uh, when they beat Beasley. When, they, when Ariel beat Beasley, woo, they couldn't believe it, boy. Cause you know, Beasley came in there with their fresh warm-up. So Ariel coming out with their big uniforms, all too big for the short. <laughs> hey, they got that in eight. Now, no, I'm just kidding, but some of them too big. Man, they ended up beating them. Well, that was a style oh. back then. That was a style back then. Because Danny mm -hmm. coached, what, in 1979? <laughs> <laughs> Danny coached his ass off that game, boy. And they yeah. came in there with the whole school. Beasley and Whitey up in there, man. They got they, Ariel. They had, Ariel had this little bitty kid. Man, he was a real little bitty kid. He was killing. I was like, man, who is this little dude? Was it Chase? Hopefully, huh? Was it Chase Adam? I don't know. Danny, who was that little guy that you had on your team that was just killing everybody? Because that was when Namari was still in high school at Beasley. So I don't know. Oh, uh, Chase Adams played at uh, Ariel. Yeah, Ariel. I think he, yeah, I think him and Kizo played together. Oh. Yeah. No, well, no, because this is when Namari Burnett was still in. Uh, oh, okay. In middle school. Uh, in yeah. middle school. Oh, and okay. this is when we were shooting the show, the bringing up ballers, that whole deal. Oh, okay. okay. And Danny was the coach. Boy, them doggone Beasley folks walked up out of there. Boy, they like, man, this will never happen again. Because they had all the size. Right. And that's another guy I'm, I'm looking forward to watching this year, too, uh, Chase Adams. He's at, uh, where is he? Is he in Mississippi? No, he's at Jackson State. Jackson State, yeah. He's at Jackson yeah. State. So I'm looking forward to watching him play this year too. Shout that's out my, to Chase, that's my little man. guy. Good guy. Yeah, Chase, good uh, good yeah. young man, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and Kizo, you said Kizo, look, Kizo's still China, playing, right? In, uh Mexico. I think he said Mexico. Yeah. But oh, he ultimately said that, he said he said that was Terrence uh Boykin. The is he guard. still playing right now? I don't that's know. <clears throat> But uh, we just want these young guys, man, to use their platforms and they main, main man, main man said he wanted to get uh he wanted us to get Sean Dockery or Will Bynum on. Definitely uh Will Bynum and definitely Sean Dockery from Jr. Man, they used to battle, dude. Did you hear that back in high school? And one that's would have all 50, I heard about. One would have 50, the other one had 45. But the I couldn't understand was. what happened to Sean Dockery when he went to Dallas. I mean, uh, uh Duke. 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 What happened? System, How did his numbers jump? System, like he dude. was everything. System, man. It was a system. We got we we can get his we can get we can get big doc on too. You know, big doc get Sean. So big dockery. We need you and your son to come on on all ball Chicago. That we get that fa that father and son that love, and y'all come on and chop it up with us on all ball Chicago. That's what's up. All right, so we got. We got the next two weeks. We got booked already. 
We got Cheryl and we got Bo Rat. And, and you know what? I'm for that. I'm grateful. I can't believe Brooklyn Nets got hired Jock Vaughn. Wow, that is something, right? I don't know if Jock Vaughn can gonna be able to handle those personalities, man. Well, he coached in the league before. You know, you wonder sometimes though. But he don't seem like a tough dude. Like KD need them. KD but but Bob, but really, but really, do you need a tough dude, or do you need a guy that knows how to somebody know relate though? Yeah, to relate to them though, too, and 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 know how to push their buttons to make them do something. You know, some people yeah. don't know how to do that. You know, some people just sit back and just say let y'all hoop. But it's something like man, like I know for instance if. When I was playing with Cox, for instance, Cox would say something about another player on the team or what they may have said, but they probably didn't say, right? It was going to be y'all lie, get y'all come, come on, man. Come on. So it's all you about that. You got to push those buttons. Yep. And big shout out, man. I got to give love to my main man, Dion Butler, man. That was one of my best, you know, friends, man. And Smooth guy, man. Smooth. And, and, man. And, and, and coming out of middle school was the best point guard in Chicago. Hands down. I'm just going to say no it question. right now. No question. He, he was the best point guard. So that's my guy. I agree. Earl Butler, Dion Butler, who Butler, went on to Mendel. I, I think Earl should have stayed at Mendel, but, you know. They said them Simeon, he, he told the story. He said, man, Simeon, Ben and them came to Mendo and said, man, got him out of the class. And said, man, you go to Simeon, man. I don't doubt and, that. Uh, and the rest was history, man. So big, big shout out to my man, Earl Butler. Man, shout out to Deion Butler, man. That's my boy right there. You know that, right? Yeah. You know yeah. that's my man, man. We got, we got to get Earl along. We got to get Earl along. Keith Gill, my man, Keith Gill, appreciate you, man. We got to get you on too, Keith. Because you and your brother was a hell of a tandem over there at, at uh, Rich Central, too, which they didn't change the name now, heard, uh, Rich Central. But we got to get you on, too, Keith, man. You're doing big things, too, out there, man. So let's definitely get you on. Uh, anything else, Bob? You got anything man, else going listen, on? It, it, it's just, man, it's just a joy to be able to sit and talk basketball. I never thought I'd be the ghetto Ted Koppel. But I appreciate the opportunity to be on this show. <laughs> Who was that? Uh, James Brown. They used to do the NBA. Right. That was my guy right there. But just, man, being able to do this show, man, and just have fun doing it with no pressure. We ain't got nobody standing over us. We ain't being policed because we know how to police ourselves. And that's what one, one thing about our society. Knowing how to police ourselves and be held accountable for what we're saying and be held accountable for our own actions. Right. No. And that's what All Ball Chicago is all about. Right. Uh, man, man, we already had Arthur on, Arthur uh, Ag, but we didn't get his co-host because I know they got their own show too, uh, Gates. We didn't get Gates on, and Gates, both of them was in the uh, Hoop Dream documentary. We'd love to get both of them on together and chop it up. Yeah, because we ended up having my man on there, uh, Clark, right, the one that got shot. Oh, Sean. Yeah. Sean, Sean, yeah. Sean Harrington. Yeah, Sean. Uh, Bob, what, what, what's the special occasion, man? We, we got Tim coming on. You put on a, a tie. Man, you know I work. You know I oh. got a, a job. Man. I actually got a job. I might oh. not look, it might not look like I got a job, but I actually got a job. Oh, okay. And sometimes I put a suit on for my job. Oh, okay. I, but I prefer to wear sweats every day if I could. And flip flops. Right. I know that's right, man. You know? Big shout out to the Bulls, man. The Bulls are doing their thing this year too, man. So we will we will start, you know, tuning in a little bit more and giving some information about our Chicago Bulls too. Uh, the the teams that's from Chicago in high school is getting, you know, getting hot. Saint Rita, Saint Rita High School, they got some pieces over there. I'm gonna go watch me some high school basketball. Now that I don't have no sons playing and all of that, I can actually go sit and enjoy a game. And go watch right. me some kids play basketball. Bob seemed like the ladies' man, the OG that makes 20 and 30 year olds look bad. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. That love, Melissa. Give my man that love, man. Bob. Because Bob be talking that. He be talking that talk, but he walked that walk. You know? Yeah. Yeah, but I ain't gonna I ain't gonna bore the ball game. 
Nah, you I ain't right. gonna throw rice at him. Nah, I ain't gonna say yeah. that. But I want to give me something to eat, though, Liv. It's time, man. I gotta go give me something to eat. Hey, yeah. We're looking for somebody to sponsor us some food. Y'all gonna sponsor us? <laughs> Definitely. Don't ask me and Liv something. Definitely. We put y'all out there too. We put y'all out there too, man. Giordano's, yeah, come man. on, somebody. Oh, oh, oh I'm already we're giving the... y'all a little snippet, man. Yeah, you just Giordano's. You just. I just gave him a pump. You just a plug. Mac Maxwell Street. We, we, come on, man. Man, we, dude, I gotta zip it. I gotta months. zip it until we get it, man. That's four shows a month. High elite entertainment. You can have your logo. You can have your information. We can drop your buzz right here on All Bar Chicago. Peace, Bob. Man, you have a good one, man. And to all of our listeners out there, make sure you take care of yourself. Tell your family members how much you love them, man. And we out here. We out of here, Bob. And I got the legend, the NBA veteran, the McDonald's All American, your host, Marcus Liberty. It's time for the percolator. It's time for the percolator. <laughs> it's time for the percolator. <laughs> Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank y'all for watching. Chicago. Oh, boy. Shut